vast majority of vision problems are actually brain problems. By 2050, 50% 50 of the world will be nearsighted. The average American spends seven hours and four minutes a day on a screen. Can I reverse my poor eyesight? Yes. 20 things better for us than carrots in terms of our eyes. Omega-3s are great for cognition and cardiovascular health, but specifically for eye health. So let's dive in, all right? So Dr. Bryce Applebaum, thank you for being with us today. Um, you know, did a little bit of research on you, uh, visionhelp.com. You've got the screen fit program. So let's just start first by talking about vision, right? So can you give us like a, just lay the foundation on what's going on with vision? I, I've heard that, I've seen statistics where 80% of people, I think in over in Asia are myopic, right? They have what is that near sight? They can't see far away, right? Um, and so what's going on with the vision? Like, is this like, what's causing it? And is, is there any correlation with age? As we get older, is are, are people's eyes getting worse or is it a function of something else? So grateful to be on here and, and excited to share all the work that, that we're doing in, in my field and, and empower people to know that there's so much that we can do about vision that we don't even know about. So. To answer your question, I think it's important to first, to, you know, separate eyesight and vision as separate entities. Eyesight being the ability to see, whether that's letters on a chart and an eye exam, street signs, you know, if your child with the teacher writes on the board in the classroom. Eyesight's really a symptom, and that's what we have glasses or contacts for. Vision is far more complex. Vision is how our eyes move together and converge and track and focus and process information and really how we understand our world and then direct the appropriate action. So really we should be thinking about vision as brain and then eyesight as just eyes and symptoms. And so the vast majority of vision problems are actually brain problems and they're functional and they're often hidden because so many doctors are solely focused on getting you to see those tiny letters on the letter chart and intervening when there's disease, which obviously is important but what about what our brain does with the information our eye sends it and how it derives meaning and directs that appropriate action? That's, that's what we need our eyes and our brain working together for, for life. So, you know, you bring up a really important topic with, with, you know, eyesight as we age and nearsightedness and farsightedness. I mean, the vast majority of vision problems are from our environment and from not having the foundation and, or tools in place to be able to support the demands that are being asked of us. So, you know, kids who are on screens all day long or reading in kindergarten before they're visually ready, you know, it's creating this global epidemic now where far away getting blurry is so often a symptom of a near functional problem. And if we're addressing the symptom of far away is fuzzy, here's glasses to make it clearer, Often that becomes a crutch, that becomes our new normal. We then need something stronger to maintain that same clarity. And we go down this vicious cycle. You know, statistic wise in, in America, in 70s and 80s, it was about a fourth of America that was nearsighted. Fast forward to now, it's about 42 to 44%, depending on where you read. Wow. And it's estimated that by 2050, half of the world, 50% of the world will be nearsighted. And, you know, there's genetics, there's environment, but this is environment and this is the new world we're in where technology is everywhere. And so certain countries, that number is way higher than others. And it's, it's a problem. You mentioned a couple of things like screen times, kids looking at reading before they're ready. What, a, what is the, the main underlying cause of all of these eyesight problems? So to really simplify things, we've got two types of two main types of eye muscles. We have inside muscles that control our focusing system. That's making something clear, keeping it clear. That lets us know what something is. We have outside muscles that controls our eye coordination, eye pointing system that lets us know where something is. In a normal, healthy brain, the where and the what, those two systems are giving us feedback on where things are in relation to us, where we are in relation to those objects, and allows us to uh, be confident navigating through space. So often stress is how we adapt or avoid. And in most cases, these vision problems are, are in response to visual stress of all this near demand. So 
technology up close, reading before they're ready. Right now, like us staring at screens to communicate here, you know, vision is intended to be guiding movement and to be allowing us to explore our three dimensional world, not to be stuck on a 2D screen for hours and hours and hours. Um, you know, the average American spends seven hours and four minutes a day on a screen and that's average, yeah. which means many people are way more than that. So, you know, the, the problems are really from faulty synergy of these systems and our brain not using our eyes appropriately and the muscles becoming more rigid and less flexible and losing elasticity. And then we're adapting to what's being asked of us. So if we're intentional with what we do, if we're, you know, putting in mindful habits, if we're modifying our lifestyle, and if we're doing brain training to support vision, you know, we can thrive in the world that we're in now, but most people don't know that. And on top of that, for almost everybody, it has to be trained or artificially created in an environment rather than having it naturally occur on our own where we can handle all that's being asked of us visually. So if I'm hearing what you're saying correctly, um, it's kind of the opposite of what we've been taught, that <clears throat> vision is genetic, that if your parents have bad eyes, you're going to have bad eyes, put on some glasses, the glasses will fix it. But in fact, we're making our eyes worse by wearing these glasses and it's not genetic. It's what we're doing. Is that, is that so, correct? A lot of that is correct. So, you know, if our parents are nearsighted, it makes us more likely that maybe we'd be nearsighted. You know, right now, if, if two parents were nearsighted and they were to have a child in the U S today, there's a one in two chance their child would be nearsighted. If one parent was nearsighted, there's a one in three chance that their child would. And if neither parent is, there's a one in four chance. And that's because of our environment. And that's because of the world we live in now. And so, you know, there are treatments and there's protocols and there's strategies that can dramatically decrease the likelihood of our kids becoming nearsighted. And in many cases, draw a line in the sand and stop it if it's caught early enough. But, you know, the, the parent who uh, has their child buried in a tablet all day long and who isn't outside and who is in the dark reading or, or on screens. I mean, we now have research and data to show what's causing all of this chaos. And if we know better, we can do better. What, what I find interesting is, you know, I recently read a study from, I think it was like 1998, where they figured out that it was the amount of light coming in to children's eyes from the age of, I guess, one to five that that's basically causing all this. And, you know, again, not that I'm like a scientist or, you know, researcher, but why am I hearing about this now, 20, 30 years later? And the best thing anybody tells me to do with children is like, oh, you know, have them look away every 15 minutes or something for every hour. You know, what's going on with this? There's not enough people like you guys empowering the world, raising awareness and educating us. You know, there's, there's studies that say two hours a day of being outside has a drastic positive influence on our ability to develop nearsightedness. It's helpful. It's protective, you know, taking breaks, you know, we should all be taking breaks at least every 20 minutes for at least 20 seconds, looking at something at least 20 feet away, 20, 20, 20, every time we're on a screen and every time we're doing sustained near concentration tasks. And that's at a minimum. I mean, we should be taking breaks way more often and, relaxing our focus and looking out into the distance. I mean, if you think about us as humans evolutionarily, we're meant to be scanning the horizon for prey and for attackers. And, you know, now we're making these really intricate, careful eye movements, but up close on a screen with blue light and contrast blasting our eyes and our brains. And the eye movements are not what we're intended to be doing with our eyes. And so, you know, it's creating this generation of, of kids, but also just humans in general that are having social development issues, emotional development issues, cognitive development issues, but of course now visual development issues because we're not engaging in this three-dimensional world that we live in. And really vision is, is intended to be guiding our movement and to be de-stressing our system, not creating additional stress on the system.
So you said something really interesting. You said that eyesight is mental. So I'm 40. I actually just turned 41 today. And Happy I'm birthday. on this. Oh, thank you. I'm on this mission to reverse my nearsightedness. Is it possible for someone my age, since it is mental, if I rewire my brain, do the right exercises, can I reverse my poor eyesight? So in so many cases, yes. And if you can think about, you know, a prescription increasing every year and getting new glasses every year, it's not increasing because there's these drastic anatomical changes. It's increasing because you're adapting to the lens that you're in. You're needing something stronger to maintain that same clarity. And then we're going on this down, downhill spiral. You know, it's kind of like if we were to, to wear a brace on our arm, you know, that becomes your new normal. And so if your prescription can increase drastically with time, if we address the underlying functional problem, then in theory, that should be able to allow us to go backwards or at a minimum, allow us to do more with less. And so, you know, somebody who has anatomically an eye that's much longer than what's considered normal, if the image that's being sent from the front of our eye to the back of our eye for our brain to process it, and I don't think anybody wants to know that the anatomy or neurology of, of how that process works, but if the eye is misshapen, then a lens moves the image to where it needs to be and we can see it better. But we now see that eyeballs are elongating as prescriptions are increasing to counter this problem. And so, you know, in many cases, especially as, you know, in certain timelines in life, we can absolutely slow down the process, often reverse the process. And, you know, for you being 41 years young, in our, usually for most people in our 40s at some point, our focusing system, the inside muscles that are responsible for clarity, they become more rigid and less flexible just based off of age. But just like any muscle in our body, if we stop using it, we lose voluntary control of it. So your ability to lock in at any distance, if you do nothing, is going to slowly deteriorate. But why not use your eyes to retrain the software of your brain to change how you're using vision to prolong that process and to make it so that you're able to take in a larger position of space more efficiently. What's driving this conspiracy then of going to a doctor who's educated like you and giving you stronger prescription every time, as opposed to helping you treat as you're discussing? You know, unfortunately, healthcare in, in this country is very much reactive and not proactive. And once we're seeing far away blurry, once we're seeing eyesight problems that you know require glasses, let's say, the process has already started. And so, you know, we're not being preventative, we're just being reactionary. And so in school, we are all taught to intervene when there's eye disease and to look at structure, but very little is taught on function. And even in the eye care world, I mean, I, my practice is, is, I'm in Maryland, right outside DC. There's six or 7,000 eye doctors in DC and Maryland. There's seven of us who are board certified in vision therapy and rehabilitation, which is the specialty that, uh, that I provide my patients that I practice. And even among those seven, there's such a, there's such variety in terms of what treatment looks like, models of vision, um, because, you know, it's our, our system is stuck from many decades ago. And as we are evolving, so much has changed post COVID because of this huge introduction of screens into life and technology into life. So I've been saying for a while now, screen time is the new pandemic and we're seeing this across the board. And I think I read recently, the average piece of research doesn't get put into clinical data or into clinical practice until 17 years after it's been published. That's crazy. Wow, so it's outdated at that point. Absolutely. So our eyes get worse as we <clears throat> use stronger lenses. You said, in theory, we can reverse that process by going backwards. Can you get super practical with us and paint the picture? What does that look like to reverse the process? So totally depends on the person and the situation. And... You got to be careful what you read on the internet and what, what you what you listen to. I mean, there's many people who say, "Oh, just take off your glasses, and then you're going to be able to you're going to you're going to be fine." 
you know, in, in reality, that doesn't really work so much for so many people. So brain training, where we can learn how to, where you can learn how to use your eyes to retrain the software of your brain to change how you're using vision in the form of neurooptometric vision therapy can establish the foundation to support doing more with less. And so specifically the focusing system and those inside muscles, they become more rigid, they become less flexible, they become stuck at a certain distance. So by developing better stamina and flexibility and relying on neuroplasticity, the brain's ability to rewire itself, to create new connections, to heal if there's been a concussion or traumatic brain injury and, and an injury that was acquired, um, you know, we can access so many areas of our brain that we've been avoiding or not tapping into. You know, vision's represented in 40 to 50% of our brain in terms of just where everything is located. And there's more areas of our brain dedicated to processing vision than all of our other senses combined. So by learning how to tap into these and arranging the conditions to raise to your awareness what you're doing, so you can learn how to self-correct and self-monitor and to establish these visual skills and abilities and allow them to be integrated with movement and balance and thinking and vestibular input that literally becomes a new you and you're able to open up your visual world and use these systems more automatically and, and more easily. So how do we do that? Are, are there any exercises that you recommend or things that people can do on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, let's talk about top three things we can do here. So first one, uh, let's, let's call it the near far focus. And so what you can do here is uh, take one hand and cover up on your eyes. And then I want you to look as far out into the distance as you can, ideally about 30 feet or so away, but really throw your focus as far out as you can. Hold that for five seconds or so. And then take a pen, pencil, even your finger. Bring it as close to your eye as you can until it gets a little blurry. Stop, make it clear. And I want you to hold it there for five seconds and think about constricting that inside muscle. You'll see your pupil getting much smaller because our focusing system's behind our pupil. Kind of look hard at it, really lock that system in. And then after five seconds, throw the focus out into the distance for, for five seconds. And then back up close for five seconds, back in the distance. So it's almost like doing push-ups with your focusing system. Now we want to do it the same amount of time, right eye, as we do with our left eye. And we'll notice that that finger or that pencil or whatever you're using up close is probably at different distances depending on which eye you're using, which means you're literally focusing your eyes at different planes and probably had no idea that you're doing that. So in life, if you're reading or on a screen and one eye is focusing maybe in front of the other, that's a roadblock in place preventing your eyes from working together as a team and almost allowing for a competition or a rivalry over sensory input, which I had to pick. Does that help for near and far sightedness? So uh, it does. Uh, so first let's talk about, so near sightedness typically is far away is blurrier than up close. Far sightedness typically is reverse there, but to really look at far sightedness from a different perspective, what that means is you have to put in con conscious effort to make something clear at every distance but it doesn't become an issue far away until 40s and beyond when those anatomical changes occur. We do nothing to counter them. And then your brain needs help to lock in at every distance. So view this as like our focusing systems, like an old school camera. If it's stuck on manual focus, we got to get it on autofocus so we can make Z axis, what's in front of us, much clearer and easily. Can you explain that post 40 eyesight loss? Yeah. So the medical term that you hear is presbyopia. The term doesn't matter, but if you hear it, you'll know what it means. And what that is, is the, the, mus the muscles inside of our eyes are behind our pupil that, and these are, this is our accommodation, our ability to react and make something clear. The muscles control a lens inside of our eye. And so when things look close or when things are close, our lens is locked in. When things are far away, our, our lens is relaxed. So if we, again, use that camera analogy, if we're stuck on autofocus, we can function really nicely. If we're stuck on manual focus, we need glasses or help for something here and here and here. And so you see people who have two, three, five different pairs of glasses, depending on what they're doing, because they're not able to functionally take in those different planes naturally. 
as we age, those muscles become a little bit like they're stuck in the mud. If we go grab over the counter readers and say, oh, wow, this magnifies things, this makes things great. You literally lose rapport with that system. You learn how to use those muscles. And we all know that we can exercise all the muscles in our body. We all know that going to the gym and working out is great for so many aspects of just longevity and, and anti-aging and, you know, and so much of, of keeping what we have for longer. But for some reason, folk doing eye exercises or doing neuro-optometric vision therapy is just not on most of our radars. So I have plenty of patients in their 70s, 60s, even some in their 80s who literally go to the eye gym every day, whether it's at home or for more substantial problems, they come into one of my offices. They work these systems and they delay the need for needing glasses or in you know worst case scenario, the glasses they need to help give them an advantage are way, way weaker than they would have been if they're getting the most, the largest amount of magnification possible. So second procedure that we should start implementing right away in our daily routine to improve vision would be eye stretches. And so what eye stretches are, are you're going to cover up an eye with one hand. You're going to look as far up to the ceiling as you can hold it for five seconds. If you're looking too far that you can't hold it steady, go a little bit lower, but hold that for five seconds. Look as far down to the floor as you can hold it for five seconds far as you can to the left, to the right. Also do it in the diagonals as well, kind of like a compass. Same amount of time, right eye is left eye, but we're literally expanding our range of motion with our eyes and allowing for uh, less stress on the system. Third uh, procedure that we can all start implementing right, right today into our daily routines would be a, a, focus, a focus trombone activity. So cover up an eye, take something with really small print, or again, a pen or the pad of your finger, and you want to just slowly trombone that in, making sure it's clear, keeping it clear. If it's blurry, stop and try and make it clear. But then you're going to slowly kind of bring this as close in as you can, making it clear, and then slowly bringing it all the way out. And then slowly back in. So instead of the, the near-far focus we talked about, which was throwing focus out, stimulating up close and kind of this push up like mentality. This is a more slowly and methodically controlled uh, stimulation of the muscle. If you watch somebody doing this, you'll see the pupils doing this. It's getting smaller as you get close. It's getting bigger as you go far. And we're kind of cre creating a slow methodical control of that. The near far focus activity is literally throwing it out throwing it in. So you'll see the pupil go really big and dilate, then you'll see it get really small and constrict. So we want to kind of hit that from, from multiple angles. Um, there's honestly an, inf an infinite number of uh, vision exercises or vision procedures we could be doing at home. And of course I'm biased, but the vast majority of people I work with need a lot more than just home activities. And so in my office, we literally arrange the conditions to raise to somebody's awareness, how they're using their visual system, whether that's high tech with virtual reality or eye tracking computers or really low tech with wearing certain filters or prism or lenses where let's say somebody has an eye turn and the eye turns 10 units, whether they're looking in or out or up or down or near or far, we can literally take a prism which just moves light or the image to where the eye is and then teach them how to keep it there. So somebody with double vision can all of a sudden see single vision by relying on that prism. Now, I'd, I would argue ultimately, we then teach their brain how to do well beyond what the prism can do so that they don't need the prism and they can learn how to straighten their eyes and develop the depth perception that comes when we use our both eyes together. Because most eye turns have nothing to do with eye muscle strength or length They're They have to do with coordination. So there's a lot of different scenarios in terms of what we can do activity wise. And uh, we even have an online vision training program called screen fit designed to minimize the damage that screens have on our eyes and to establish better uh, visual habits and more mindful habits so that we can actually thrive in this visual world. And, and that's a program that has on each course, 30 different lessons that 
uh, help establish that foundation and improve visual skills so that we can engage with screens more efficiently and more easily. So I've heard this a lot, that active focus is a very important exercise to be using to improve your vision. But it seems like no one can really explain it properly. Um, a lot of guys say, well, it's when you see something and it's blurry, and then you blink your eyes a few times and then it's clear, and that's active focus. I've heard other guys say it's when you focus on something and then you you kind of expand your peripheral and then you're aware of the other things that are not in focus. So can you shed some light on active focus, what that is specifically and how we use that to improve our vision and which one of those exercises was the closest thing to it? So, so much of our mental focus is grounded in where we place our visual focus. And I always say to people who've been diagnosed with ADD or ADHD, that those are incomplete diagnoses unless we've screened or looked for functional vision problems and rule them out first because the symptoms and behaviors are so similar. So in terms of active focus, we have different pathways in our brain. Two in particular, one responds to central input in front of us, one responds to side vision, peripheral input around us. In a normal healthy brain, we're using these two systems together so that we can keep focus at every distance. But when our brain is under stress or when our body's under stress from a vision standpoint, what that looks like is our pupils widen and we lock in with this tunnel vision, which is why so many people when they're driving or going over a bridge when they're driving can go into a panic attack and lock in because they're so aware of what's in the periphery that it makes them try and control what they can. And it's almost like they're looking through tunnel vision or paper towel holders. So if we can think about active focus as kind of hard gaze and inactive focus is almost soft gaze, hmm. the more we can take in peripherally with our side vision, the more we can kind of sit back and, and take in the whole world, uh, the better rapport we have with space, but the easier it is for these systems to work together. And so a really good activity to help support that rather than the ones we talked about would be something called peripheral pointing, which would be, again, we, we always want to do these one eye at a time because if there's an eye coordination problem, some of these activities could uh, be disrupted a little bit. If we're doing each eye on their own, we're going to have no issues with things getting worse. But peripheral pointing would be to cover up your eye pick a position far away in the distance in the room, maybe it's a doorknob or light switch, just keep your eyes pointing right on that. Don't look away from that. And then pick something else in the room that's away from that. So maybe it, it's a chair or a lamp. Keep your eye where it is, don't look away, but then with your finger, kind of point to where you think that lamp is with your side vision, but don't move your eye to get there. And then when you think you're right on it, Tell your brain to move your eye to where you're pointing and then see how close you are. And you'll notice you're probably a little bit too close to the left or the right or off. So then come back to center, bring your hand down and then do it again. And you kind of keep doing that until you recognize you're more accurate and where you're pointing. And then you're literally mapping out your side vision. Wow. For, for so many of us, we can activate central vision or we can activate peripheral vision, but it's really hard to use them together. And you'll notice that when you're walking on the street, you'll notice that you can see, you know, the house to the left, you can see the mailbox to the right, but it really takes intention and active effort to kind of take in both simultaneously. And when that happens, everything becomes clearer. We hear about athletes who are in the zone or in the flow state. We can neurologically actually understand what that means from a vision standpoint. And to really simplify it, it's this heightened state of central and peripheral processing where we're so aware of what's around us that we can lock in in front of us and almost have life take place in slow motion because our reaction and our visual awareness is, is uh, that heightened in that scenario. Gotcha. So can you break down the mechanics of why peripheral vision is important? So as we practice this, how does that help improve our vision? Um, you know, seems like focusing, I, I get these, right? If you're focusing close and far, that helps your focus, but how does improving all that on the peripheral improve your vision? When we move, 
the images that move along our the back of our eyes allow us to understand space and what's in front of us and allow us to see in depth. So if you were to lock out peripheral vision and just look with central vision, it's really hard to see in 3D. It's really hard to understand spatial challenges because although we have two eyes, our brain infers input from both eyes, the difference between them in space puts that information together to allow us to see in depth. Depth perception is not something we're born with. Every child is born without the ability to focus, converge, track, use their eyes. It's learned through our life experiences. And we have cells in the back of our brain and our visual cortex that only grow or only form from two-eyed learning. Wow. And that allows us to see in 3D, that allows us to have depth perception, that can be trained, established, or tapped back into at any age for any brain, even though most doctors will say neuroplasticity for vision only occurs up until age eight or five or 12, depending on what research you read. We know that at any age, any brain can be taught new tricks. And maybe the neuroplasticity is uh, not as great for a 90 year old as it is for a, an eight year old, but there's still malleability. There's still the ability for our brain to adapt. And you know that that's something that mm -hmm. Uh, most people have no idea is even possible. These exercises, <clears throat> how do they help the um, the locking of that muscle you mentioned, right? From what I understand, when you focus too much up close, the there's a muscle, the ciliary muscle that locks the lens in place. So are these exercises helping to relax that? Which one of these would be the best for that? So if we were all to squeeze our fist really hard, after about five seconds, your hand starts to hurt. But if you were to let go and squeeze and let go and squeeze, you could probably do that for hours, right? When we're on a screen, for instance, like we're doing right now, our pupils get smaller, our ciliary body, like you mentioned, locks in and the muscle itself constricts. We're then stuck at this distance until you look away from the screen. So developing better flexibility and stamina with that system would be, you know, low level, the, the near far focus activity or the focus trombone activity. But high level, you come to uh, an office like mine, the eye gym, and we literally have lenses where we'd have you look at a screen or pick out a book or something to look at, look through one side of the lens that stimulates your focus, look through another lens that asks you to relax your focus, and then we have you flip back and forth. And maybe we have you flip it back and forth every 10 seconds or every two seconds. It's kind of like going to the gym and doing a picking up a, a dumbbell and doing a curl. You're constricting, you're letting go, you're constricting, letting go. We can create, we can build that system to allow it to be more flexible and be able to stay at any distance for longer, just based off of the amount of work that we put in. We all hear the term blue light. Can you describe it, explain it, how and how your course helps correct this? So blue light has kind of become the new gluten in today's world where everybody it's the sexy topic that everybody's talking about. Blue light is not bad for us. Blue light is actually crucial for us and really important for us, but that's natural blue light from the sun and from outside. That's not the blue light that is blasted to our eyes from our screen all day long. So in terms of all visible light, Blue light is the short wavelength, high energy light that's anywhere from like 400 to 450 nanometers. Blue light from the sun is what we want to experience first thing in the morning for two to 10 minutes, let's say. And towards the end of the day, before we go to bed, when it allows our brain to be synced in terms of sleep-wake signaling and allows us to know uh, how to make sense of time. And when the sun is in different positions, it emits different spectrum of light. So for regulating circadian rhythms, for mood, for alertness, even for metabolic health, blue light's really important to get naturally from life in the morning and in the evening. And we have cells in our retina in the back of our eye who have special sensors whose sole job is to respond to light and let us know when we're awake and when we're not. And that is the, some of the most metabolically active cells in our entire body are in the back of our eyes and our retina. So if those cells are overstimulated, if they're on overdrive, 
all day long because you're on a screen for eight, 10, 12 hours, your brain literally loses the ability to regulate itself in terms of alertness and releasing melatonin and all that comes with what's needed from blue light. So I, I always recommend digital performance lenses for at least the middle chunk of the day and evenings if you're on devices, which would be really high quality blue light filters that block ideally 90 to hundred percent of, of blue light, but then also with the right therapeutic lens in those glasses. And so that's not glasses that take something blurry and make it clear. Not like your glasses, Dan, that are compensatory. These would be therapeutic in that, let's say it's a low amount of, of magnification that is balanced and the same between each eye because it gives the brain a better opportunity for the eyes to work together. It decreases some of the visual stress. It relaxes the focusing system. So maybe you have a better opportunity for your eyes to coordinate and point in the same place. A really good quality blue light filter, not the ones that are $5 on Amazon because you're paying for what you get, but ones that block a large, large chunk of blue light, really important to be using, especially second half of the day or in the evening if we're trying to fall asleep at a normal time without having our brains being blasted by all this, this light. How do we figure out what is a good pair? So there's a few companies that are very reputable that have really good quality blue light filters. Any eye doctor can make these with their lab. And so typically, you know, most eye doctors or most places that make glasses, they'll have different tiers of blue light filters, let's say. You always want to get the moder the, the the more expensive ones are usually the higher tier, but I would definitely check with with that doctor or that lab what percentage of blue light is blocked here. Um, typically, they're going to look a little uh, purplish or bluish if they're decent level, and if they're really good quality, it's going to be yellow, amber, reddish, orangish because that's. Uh, what happens when that certain chunk of the visual spectrum is blocked out if it's like 100% blockage, let's say. What are your thoughts on uh, UVEX? Many people are very happy with, with, with those lenses. And we do a lot of work with tints and filters for patients where let's say somebody has a traumatic brain injury. There's a certain color uh, called omega, which is like a purplish, which changes the hypersensitivity of the brain to responding to light. Or somebody who has a condition called visual snow or migraines sometimes do really well with a yellowish type of tint called FL41. Uh, the lenses you bring up, I, I think typically uh, can be really, really good quality. Those I, I noticed were kind of wraparounds. And so for some people, yeah, yeah. especially with concussion, that, that can actually distort things too much, even mm -hmm. though it's protective. But often when there's a concussion, let's say there, there's a visual sensory overload where going to the mall or grocery store or something where a place that has all this crowded, busy information visually to the to the sides in the periphery, it can create this this sense of overwhelm because the brain can't filter and process all that information. And it's almost like you want to retreat. So I, I know of many people, uh, many patients of mine who are in the process of recovering from a head injury who have those wraparounds and it's actually um, protective in, in many ways. Blue light from the screen you're saying is not necessarily bad. It's just bad after a certain time of day. Is that correct? Or is it even bad to look at screens in general? So I would say blue light from the sun and from life is great. Blue light from the screen typically is always bad. So always, okay, always. Even in the morning. Okay. So we, a lot of people who try and uh, aggressively go into this fight would say, well, there's no research or literature that says blue light damages the eyes or blue light from the screens damages the eyes. But we know blue light from the screens causes eye strain and fatigue and light sensitivity and disrupted sleep. Um, blue light from the sun is what we want to help regulate ourselves. But from the screens in general, you know, the, the night shift mode that you can click on Apple products or bringing the contrast really low and then slowly increasing it to a more comfortable level, uh, that can be really helpful. But screens in general, you know, cause, cause lots of extra stress on the visual system. And so you wanna, when engaging with screens, we wanna try and 
reduce the room lighting that's the ambient around us. So avoid really harsh light and, and light that's too bright. Try and use natural light as much as you can. Um, typically the LED lights are, although they're more energy efficient, they produce much more blue light than kind of the old school incandescent lights. Um, this is an excuse to get the biggest screen you can and put it as far away as we can. <laughs> so update, upgrade your computer screens, you know, the bigger the monitors, you know, that are larger, have higher resolution and usually less strain on the eyes. Uh, but then also glare can be something that really causes eye strain or fatigue or decreased uh, productivity and symptoms with screens. And so as silly as it sounds, nobody cleans their screens. And nobody uses anti-glare screens or even anti-reflective coatings on, on their glasses. Even just wiping down our screens can do wonders on decreasing glare and, and sensitivity for many people. You know, even just for ideal sleep hygiene, we want a pitch black room. We don't want any blue light or any uh, light even from the TV shining in. And we know there was a study from University of Pennsylvania a while ago that said uh, kids who had night lights in their rooms or had lights in their rooms were more likely to develop nearsightedness than those who didn't. Ooh. We can do so much to control our environment to help support optimal use of our eyes and brain and body. Have you ever heard of sun gazing? Yes, so uh, sun gazing um, is, a, is a good friend of palming, which is another uh, activity that a lot of uh, old school eye doctors or kind of vision in, people who are uh, interested in vision improvement will help practice. And so with sun gazing, that's closing your eyes and slowly turning your head towards the sun, holding it for a certain amount, turning away. I don't usually recommend sun gazing because I don't know. I think there's a lot that we can do that's a lot more effective. But the mechanism behind that is even when we look at the sun with our eyelids closed, our pupils constrict. And that's because when light comes in protectively, we lock, our pupils get small. That's also the same mechanism for that ciliary body, ciliary body muscle you mentioned that controls our focus, which is why some, for many people driving or seeing at night is much harder than during the daytime because the pupil gets wider and more light comes in and is more scattered. And so it's harder for the brain to detect and use that information. So sun gazing would be having the pupil get small and getting big as you're turning towards and away from it. Uh, there, there's a, a doc, an eye doctor from 100 years ago named Dr. Bates, who has a very strong following of, of people that uh, use his protocols. Yep. Uh, one of them is sun gazing. I would say, although I'm sure many people have, have uh, been helped by the Bates method, a hundred or so years later, you would hope that we have much more accurate, scientifically based and more efficient procedures and activities and learning. And we absolutely do. But that can be maybe a starting point for some people. You know, one thing I noticed, right, when my son was about three weeks old, he would cry, right? And the only thing I would stop him crying was milk from up, right? And one day he was in my lap crying hysterically and my Apple watch turned on and he looked at it and he stopped crying. I was like, that is the definition of screen addiction. It blew my mind, like firsthand. You can take any infant at any age, walk into a room that has a TV on or an iPad that's blasting. And I would imagine within a minute, if not sooner, immediately eyes are locked in on that brightness. And that's, that's almost candy. To a, to a child's brain. And we now know gaming and certain companies capitalize on this and the dopamine release that comes from all of this arousal. And so, you know, when, you're, when your son was, you said three months old, yeah. you know, his world was still very blurry beyond arm's length because at three months old, it's, it's mom, it's food, it's, you know, our world as we, as babies get get older, it expands farther out. So he literally just saw this huge bright light and immediately wanted to move his eyes to gather more information about it. Any change in eye movement is a change in attention, whether it's voluntary or involuntary. And you're essentially raising awareness to, to what that is by seeing that. And, you know, there's a reason why a, a 
two-year-old can pick up a cell phone and know how to slide it on and get, get it engaged where that really is scary to think why that's even a place that shouldn't even be happening now. So I think the arousal that comes from the light and the technology is something that draws us all in. And in most cases, it's, you know, has negative, scary implications in terms of what that can do to overall development. So VR, we've got literally images inches from your eye where I can't even focus that closely. You know, what's behind the tech and what kind of damage is it doing to us? VR is, is absolutely taking over the world. It's the wave of the future. I'm, I'm in discussions with a few different companies about creating uh, vision therapy programs for virtual reality. So I think there's definitely a benefit in terms of, let's say, uh, somebody has a lazy eye and their brain hasn't learned how to see on one eye in equality compared to the other eye. Well, we now know that a lazy eye is a two eye problem just showing up on one side. So unless it's addressed on a two eye basis, you know, typically there's not much improvement. So the old school, uh, patching one eye, exa exactly. <laughs> yeah. There's a good eye and a bad eye. If anything, the good eye is at fault because it's too bossy. So with VR, we can literally blur the image with that good eye and make it so there's a more equalized world or even make it so that the eye that wasn't seeing as well now is having to pick out information in the presence of both eyes. And we now know the most advanced treatment for lazy eye is two-eyed work, but learning how to discriminate or pick that eye in the presence of the other eye. We have an eye tracking computer that uh, for kids, let's say, there's... Uh, asteroids that float around on the screen. And depending on where they look, the asteroid explodes. But if they're saying, I'm looking at this asteroid and it's not exploding, that means where they're telling their eye to look is different than where it's actually looking. And so that gives great feedback. So from a learning perspective, VR can be fantastic. From a visual stress standpoint, um, you know, it's a, a lot of sensory overload for many people. And you may notice that the longer you have a VR headset on, when you take it off, it's almost like you have to recalibrate in the world because you weren't receiving the light and the stimulation that you were, and it was that much more intense with them on. Uh, most VR headsets are set with the eyepieces, the oculars for distance, but there are some where that's not the case. And so, you know, there's, I always get questions about what glasses do I wear with VR and, and do I wear them or do I not? Um, it's, it's utilizing a larger portion of the retina. So the back of eye that uh, is basically the screen that the image goes on to see. And so there can be benefits where we're actually using our peripheral retina more than our central retina. So it's not as terrible in some cases as staring at a tablet for that same amount of time. But it for many people does create this sensory integration problem where vision all of a sudden is just completely fatigued and the longer we're doing that, the longer we're putting our body under a certain condition that's stressful, unless we're avoiding it, then the more likely we're going to adapt and usually in a negative way. You, you spoke about like the physical eye versus, you know, mental, meaning I guess your brain or whatever, right? Where do you see this? Is it like a 50-50 or, or does it depend on people? So in my opinion, the vast majority of vision problems overwhelmingly are brain problems manifesting through the eyes. Eyes are extensions of the brain. They're the only part of our brain that sits outside of our, our skull. And they actually are derived from, from brain in utero. They receive light and they send light to our brain to make sense of and to interpret. But our brain does all the work. Our brain does the actual seeing. And we know that when you know somebody has an eye covered, let's say, at certain periods of life. If a child goes through life with one eye covered for six months, there's going to be vision loss. But for us in our 40s to, to go through life with an eye covered for six months, if we take it off, there wouldn't be loss. There would just be, you know, it'd be a little bit bright and things. But as our brain is developed and as the cells develop that respond to eye information, there's such neuroplasticity, there's such malleability of our brain that we can literally retrain our brain to use our eyes as a team to develop more efficient skills. But really every vision problem other than 
problems to the structure of the eyes are brain problems. And so if they're addressed on a brain basis, the ceiling is that much higher in terms of what's possible than compared to if it's not. I started watching this show C, right, where everybody's blind. And at first I was like, oh, this is pretty ridiculous, you know? And then I started thinking about it further and I was like, I was thinking, I was like, are we all going blind here? Could we eventually be like a blind race? You guys promote anti-aging. So if, if you're getting your listeners to live to 100, 200, 300 years old, I, I think that's a good point you bring up. I mean, the, the structure has to hold up for the brain to interpret it. And we know that like UV light that's extreme can cause damage to the lens in our eye call causing cataracts or the retina causing macular degeneration. But there's so much we can do from a nutrition standpoint, from a supplement standpoint, from a protection standpoint to provide our brain and our eyes high doses or high amounts of what it needs to function at its peak potential. And, you know, I, I say, I always say if, if we're not addressing health and longevity with supplements and nutrition for our eyes, you know, there's a huge piece of, of healing and of longevity that's being left on the table that we're not even looking at. So, so carrots are it, is that old, uh, wise tale. So carrots are great because they have vitamin A and vitamin A is a precursor needed to help take an image and, and see it. But that's actually from World War II. And there's a whole long story behind it. There's probably 20 things better for us than carrots in terms of our eyes. Um, you know, I'm a big proponent of omega-3s. And omega-3s are great for cognition and cardiovascular health, but specifically for eye health. Uh, it allows our tear film to be more viscous and more protective so that our own tears stay in our eyes for longer. The average person blinks about 15 times a minute. And when we're looking at a screen, it goes to about three to five times a minute. So literally blinking less means your tear film is being dispersed over the front surface less. Your eyes are drying out faster. And omega-3s can be really helpful at allowing the outer layer of the tear film to be produced in a thicker, more viscous fashion so that your own tears stay in your eyes for longer and they're more protective. Um, but they're also great for, uh, for just overall brain health. And typically though with omega-3s, it's the cold water fish like sardines, anchovies, mackerel, halibut. Um, but really along with omega-3s, green leafy vegetables, ideally that are raw, are fantastic for overall just eye health. And they have something in there called zeaxanthine and lutein, which are something called carotenoids. Uh, they're basically high level antioxidants that help protect uh, our retina and areas of our eye from really harmful UV light. Um, but lutein, you know, lutein can even, there's studies that say lutein can help offset some of the detrimental effects of macular degeneration, let's say, if there's moderate to severe levels. And lutein is, is found in high amounts in, in egg yolks in the center, the center portion of egg. So lutein's great. Uh, colorful fruits and vegetables have a lot of antioxidants, vitamins A, C, and E, fantastic for the health of the eyes and for decreasing formation of some of these problems that occur. So Dr. Applebaum, all right. So I'm the kind of guy that takes health into my own hands. I love biohacking and just experimenting. I've been doing a deep dive into vision health on my own for the past six months or so. And so quick history on me, I started wearing glasses when I was about seven or eight years old. Um, and it's just my prescription got worse and worse until it maxed out at 10.75 diopters. And I had this epiphany a year ago, like, you know what? I think I can fix this. You know, I don't think it's normal. So. What I did was I started researching into, you know, like, is it possible and what are people doing? And so here's what I've been doing. I've got a uh, Snellen chart taped up on the wall over yep. there. Yep, yep. Um, and what I've been doing basically is reducing my glasses prescription, um, basically like one diopter at a time, right? I'm at, I'll start at 10.75, brought it down to 9.75. These are... 8.75s, these and these are now 7.75s. What I've been doing is just 
decreasing them and then doing eye exercises. And then once I see 2020 on that chart, I'm like, okay, time to move down to the next one. Love this. I, I'm, I'm huge into biohacking as well. This, uh, if you're intentional behind it, it works. Can I give you some tips though? Uh, of course, that's why I'm telling you. Like, do you think what I'm doing is okay? Am I, is, I, I, I think it's fan, I think it's fantastic, and I think for most people, if there's not the motivation and compliance that you have, then this just doesn't work, and it kind of pisses them off and annoys them. So, ideally, I would say do what you're doing, but do it with contact lenses. Oh, because okay. contact lenses allow you to access periphery more easily, which again will get you to lock in centrally more. What you're describing here, there's a book called Take Off Your Glasses and See that somebody does this and goes through his experience. It's from probably the 80s, 70s. And because of that, I see so many people come in and are like, yeah, I tried that and it didn't work. But if you're, you're doing the functional work on top of that. So, you know, like you said, if you're going from like 2040 ish to 2025, 2020, just like you crept up to 1075, you can also back that down. And, you know, I think doing really robust office-based vision therapy on top of that would only just speed up the process. Um, and I could easily, I mean, even doing screen fit, I think on top of that would help speed up the process as well. But you're literally changing the image and then adapting to that and allowing that to become more stable. And... I know many people who have dropped dramatically or even entirely. I'm, I'm a 1050 myself, so I'm, we're drinking the same Kool-Aid well, Are here. you right now as we speak? So, But here, here's the difference with me. I did uh, five years of vision therapy when I was a kid, and I had an alternating eye turn, and I had poor depth perception and no focusing stamina, and I attribute all of my success in life athletically, academically, and personally to what I did. But yet even with that, I'm still a 10, 1050. And the reason for that being, I was always undercorrected and had rigid gas permeable contact lenses and glasses. I had those. Oh, they're so painful. So painful. Oh well, oh. so now there's actually, there's orthokeratology. Those yeah. are absolute game changers. You literally take them off in the morning. You see crystal clear all day long, put them back in. That's the number one way to slow down the progression of nearsightedness. In most cases, stops it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I would say depending on how thick the cornea is, you can only correct a certain amount. But you know what you're doing, if, if we did accommodative work on top of that, it would just speed up the process. Amazing, cool. Yeah, it's been working so far Yeah, because I put on my original glasses and they're way too strong now. And it's crazy. How like, cool I'm is that? changing my vision. Yeah. In, in a matter of, it's been three, four months. I think people not like us in the biohacking space would just be miserable decreasing their prescription because they everyone wants to see HD clear at every distance. I always say let's be 20 happy rather than 2020. Mm -hmm. Get to a place where we can have the weakest lens possible that gives the most improvement that allows our brain to use that information as efficiently as possible. And when you have a choice over comfort versus clarity, most people will choose comfort. How do you stop the eye from degrading then? If you're like if you have a week of prescription or anything like that. Uh, you, you be intentional and you be active about it. So, you know, at, at anyone, if as it is changing, if we get them provision therapy, it always stops and in most cases reverses. But if we then go back to not getting outside, burying our head in screens, reading all day long, that stress allows for that adaptation to be driven even harder and back forward. So, you know, if, as you go through this journey, Dan, and I'm, always call or email. I'm happy to, to, to talk you through it and give you more things to work on too. Awesome, you'll, you'll get to a point where it probably slows down a little, but if you keep going, I mean, theoretically, why should you not be able to get to no glasses? That's the goal. Yeah. Doctor, are you going to try, are you going to do the same thing? Are you going to go to no glasses? Actually, you know what? I'm going to do that because we're talking about it. Nice. I'm going to yeah, do that. We'll be on the same journey. Cool. And we'll have a follow-up and I can share how, how – we'll see who gets lower faster. Yeah, we'll race. Well, I hope you liked us enough to come back. <laughs> Dude, I would, so. I, I would love it. And I love that you guys are, are just real dudes getting information out there. I mean I, I've been on a lot of podcasts lately and, and a lot of people have their own agenda. And this is fun. I could talk to you guys forever.
Thanks, thanks. So now let's flip it to, we're talking about nearsightedness. What about farsightedness? Yeah. How, how can we hack that? So that's where doing this, this work up close with focus, convergence, and eye tracking can prolong the need for that. So if you did near far focus, the focus trombone, eye stretches, peripheral pointing, if you did that every day, you would actually see an improvement. And, you know, most people, it's like your 40th birthday, you blow out the candles, and then all of a sudden you're gone, your arms aren't long enough. Yeah. Um, you know, that low level stuff if, at daily definitely pumps it down the road. But then at some point we're going to need, you know, more advanced training. So either vision therapy or screen fit or anything like that. Um, there's a lot of guys in the biohacking space who talk about vision, but just leave the doors wide open in terms of what can be done beyond that. Um, I don't know if you guys have any connections to, to Huberman, but he's a ophthalmologist by training. He talks about eye training, but he doesn't even know that this stuff even exists. I'm trying to find a way to, I mean, this would completely change the game for mankind if we could get this functional approach there. We're big fans of him. Yeah. And uh, I think at one point we're going to have him on the show. We'll, we'll, we'll make that connection. Awesome. I appreciate that. I would be forever grateful because literally that would, that would change the game in the, U, in the U.S. and beyond like overnight. Cool. Yeah. Well, hopefully he's watching this and uh, then he'll just reach out to you. Yeah, and then us. absolutely. Um, I, you know, another, another interesting thing I've noticed recently is, is going from like l dark situations to light situations. I, I've never felt an issue in the past. And now sometimes I feel like it takes a little extra second for my eyes to adjust. So have you had an eye exam before? I have, I have. And I have cataracts from, from high prednisone from years ago. Has anyone ever told you, you you needed glasses for anything? They've said that, like, if I want to sharpen my night driving, you know, yeah. so they give me this, like, really weak prescription, and I just never would use them yeah. kind of thing. And So, I mean, I could tell you to a T your exact profile just from what you've described. You know, going from night to dark for a lot of people, especially going into a tunnel, it's this blast of of – more light or less light, and then the pupil reaction changes dramatically. Very often, if there's autonomic dysfunction or systemic inflammation that delays that reaction or that response from the pupil so that the ability to transition from different environments becomes more sluggish or takes longer. Um, you doing a lot of focus work, accommodative work up close, would actually help facilitate quicker, more reactive more accurate reactions with that system. And so you, you know, it'd be easier going from night to dark. Um, we d have different photoreceptors in the back of our eye. The cones respond to color. They're responsible for, for daytime eyesight. The rods are responsible for the nighttime eyesight and rods are actually active even when we're sleeping. Most metabolically active cells in our body. Uh, there's a lot that you can take from a supplement standpoint, from a nutrition standpoint to heavily support the rods. And, you know, that could help in and of itself for you. So even taking lutein, zeaxanthine, um, you know, choline, and we're actually formulating a vision support supplement uh, currently that's going to be exactly for for that. So can we can we talk about screen fit a little bit? It's important to recognize that screens have been on the incline forever and for decades, and that's not really anything new. But in 2020 is when the pandemic catapulted screens into learning and to life and into so many aspects of where we where of how we function. So for me, as a concerned parent and one that became exponentially more concerned in during the lockdown, I was shocked to see you know how to see the negative effects that screens were having on my own kids' eyes and visual systems and even their well-being. And I remember there was this Sunday afternoon where it was 2020 and I looked across the room and I saw my youngest who was two at the time on a class play date, which meant she was staring at the, our laptop for the first time ever. And she's literally like looking around the laptop, trying to figure out why her friend is on here, but not there and like looking at all these buttons and my five-year-old twins were in, in, the, in the room as well, one with an iPad and a sheet over his head, and then the other one in the dark. 
And I remember my stomach completely dropping because clearly as a, with my background as a functional eye doctor and, you know, we were not a house that supported screen use at young ages. And also I have no idea how they got the screens because we had those locked up and only for travel on planes. Uh, but they, you know, here they were compulsively engaging with these for, for playtime, for homework, for even boredom. And to me, that's when the light bulb went off in my head for my kids. And honestly, for the entire world, screens aren't going anywhere. And this is going to become a, a bigger and bigger problem unless we do something to counter or even slow down the negative influence that these have on our eyes and on our brains. And so we, I recognize we are on the verge of this whole new pandemic unfolding right before our eyes. And that's when ScreenFit was born. So ScreenFit, I mean, if you suffer from, from headaches, tired eyes, fatigue, lack of energy, neck or back pain, can't wait to shut down your, your monitor after a Zoom call, then ScreenFit is a really robust program for you. And so it's for these exact reasons that we created this revolutionary online vision training program to help minimize the damage of screens to vision. So it's essentially a vision wellness program designed to help reduce symptoms, promote healthy visual habits mm -hmm. during extended screen time. But even more importantly, it helps train the essential visual skills uh, necessary so that you have this foundation to to succeed in this world. Uh, as yet, we've had as young as five years old go through it and as old as 89 go through it successfully, where 100% of the users have seen a reduction in symptoms. So it's www.screenfit.com. Um, and right now there's two courses on there. Each course is 30 lessons. Each lesson uh, should take 10 to 15 minutes a day to complete. And first course is more kind of the foundational work. And then the second course is more kind of stamina and integrating everything that's that's being learned there. But uh, I'm responsible for 100% of it clinically. And now we've got a whole team and uh, executive team that's that's really helping give this the legs that it deserves. So in regards to this, you know, screen fits in the name. Is, is this just for screen based people or can everybody really uh, benefit from this? As crazy as this sounds, everybody in the world who looks at a screen would benefit this from this. But even if we're not looking at a screen, I mean, this works on the main functional visual systems. So our, our tracking, which is our ocular motor control, our focusing, which is accommodation, our convergence or eye coordination. It even has visual processing in there. It has depth perception activities. It has activities where you're holding up your two thumbs and you're figuring out how to move your eyes to converge to keep them into one. And then you're keeping it one as you're moving it in different positions. You're doing rotations here. I mean, there's so much that we can do to understand how to have a better rapport with space and have our vision and our eyes work as their one cohesive unit. Now, um, you know, we all have children, right? Uh, is this something that's made for teenagers and above? Or, you know, what are you doing with your younger children? So I hate that uh, it's screen fit and it's on the screen to do it. And, but, and I get asked that all the time, but it's designed with these, with that in mind to know that every activity, every lesson has a, uh, a printout that you can use, but also most of them, like 90, about 90% 90 of the activities are not done on the screen. It just, the instructions are there, then you pull it away. So with kids, I always say have a parent look at the screen, tell them what to do, and then almost train the kid, almost be the coach for the kid. Um, for my kids, all three of my kids who are now nine, nine, and five have all uh, done office-based vision therapy. And it's amazing what we have rerouted because the genetic component of being my kid, my, uh, of me being dad has, has made them uh, not always have a full tool belt to begin with, but all three did vision therapy. Uh, all three have done screen fit. And now all three of my kids are also in digital performance lenses, which means that they know I am an absolute stickler with anything tablet, computer, tech-based, and they hate me for it, but I don't care because I'm going to protect them and I know better. But then they have digital performance lenses where they're putting their glasses on when they're on a tablet. And tablets are for when we're on a plane and in a couple rare scenarios. But other than that, I mean... We live in a three-dimensional world. The learning needs to take place in three-dimensional space. And so uh, not only have problems been eliminated for them, we've literally rerouted their vision development. 
Um, I know this is a little outside of the focus we've been talking about, but like cataracts, glaucoma, is there anything we can do about this stuff? Definitely. Um, so cataracts, typically if we live long enough, we develop them. Um, but long enough could be decades and decades later for some people. So UV protection outside definitely slows down uh, or prevents the, the lens from being damaged from, from the UV rays that, that are harmful. Um, but high, high level antioxidants can do wonders for cataracts and for even reversing them in many cases. Um, there's lots of interesting information out there about other supplements like glutathione and others that can really help, uh, attack the free radical damage that occurs. Uh, macular degeneration, again, from UV rays, from genetic predisposition. If you're an ex-smoker, if you're Caucasian, the risk levels are higher. But also we know that certain things like lutein for even moderate to severe macular degener degeneration can be really protective and really helpful at even reversing it. But, you know, what we eat in our diet is significant is what we eat in our diet significantly influences our overall inflammation, but specifically our eye health and our eye inflammation. And so, you know, a ketogenic diet or somebody who is not allowing glucose to be their primary fuel source has significantly less inflammation in their eyes. And we know that macular degeneration almost can be looked at as type three diabetes. And so if we're on top of it early enough, we can make it so macular de degeneration doesn't happen. It's really amazing. You know, we, we talk to tons of doctors all month long and the going theme and Daniel doesn't know what I'm going to say is like inflammation, you know, really a good proper diet, whether it's like vegan or Mediterranean or some type of healthy keto um, is, you know, it, it's doing wonders for every piece of the body. There hasn't been one doctor that we haven't, because I really thought this was going to be the one conversation that this didn't come into and it still slipped in at the end. So, you know, more than half my practice is concussion rehab. And that's because like I mentioned, visions represented in every lobe of our brain. And there's more areas of our brain dedicated to processing vision than all of our other senses combined. So it's impossible to have a head injury and not have vision be impacted. It's just a matter of at what level. And so we know those who are suffering from a traumatic brain injury, symptoms are triggered with gluten and dairy and sugar and alcohol and all of these things that are terrible for our entire body. But I mean, we're, if all these doctors and all of these interviews you've had are giving the same cheat code, there's something to that functional medicine, knowing that what we provide our body is the instructions for how to function optimally, you know, from an anti-aging standpoint, if we're intentional with what we put in our bodies and what we provide our brains in terms of healing and optimization, if we then take that same passion and then apply it to vision and to screens, it's pretty powerful with what, for thinking about what's possible. That's awesome. That's awesome.